Hello, students. How are y'all doing? So, huh, only if I could share the realty with y'all on life and entrepreneurship <laughs> and being an educator. I love being an educator. That's why we still on peds. Y'all ready? Here we go. So, this is part two of chapter 31 that we're going to go ahead and finish up, okay? So, um, I want to start this second part of chapter 31 talking about diabetes and uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is also known as DKA. Now, please remember, we're still talking about the pediatric patient, okay? Now, the signs and symptoms include uh, ketonuria, a decreased serum bicarbonate concentration, and a low pH, hypertonic dehydration, the fruity odor of their breath, nausea, and altered level of consciousness, which is also seen as ALOC. The symptoms can range from mild to severe, and it can occur within hours or up to days. Now, this is also referred to as diabetic coma. So you used to hear people back in the day call this diabetic coma. And even though the patient may not be in a coma, they still called it that, all right? This may result from a secondary infection and the patient does not follow proper self-care, they could go into DKA. This may also occur if the disease process in, uh, proceeds and it is unrecognized or it is undiagnosed uh, since so people can go into DKA. Uh, ketoacidosis is the end result of the effects of insulin deficiency. Now, the treatment goal for diabetes uh, mellitus, uh, which is just, you see, as DM, this ensures normal growth and development throughout um, metabolic control. This enables the child to cope with a chronic illness uh, and have a happy and active childhood and for them to be well integrated into the family and to prevent complications from um, high blood glucose and not being able to control their blood glucose. So our goal is to have tight blood glucose control. All right. So when they are children, we know that it is so on the parent in order to help control this disease process. But what we also note is that we have to educate and teach the child so that they can grow with some autonomy on knowing how to control the disease for themselves. Because what we note is, is that sometimes when we have a child with a disease process such as this and the parents are the ones that have to manage it, sometimes they just take over and manage it from them, from them being a, a young child all the way up until they are uh, late adolescents and when then when it's time for them to have to control it themselves they don't quite know what to do okay so that is also a goal for us to make sure that we are helping the parent teach the child now some of the nursing care of the child with diabetes is that we want to, the parent and the child to be educated. The patient's age, the financial, education, cultural, and religious situation must be considered when developing a teaching plan for this family and their and this child. Uh, for example, if you have a for a uh, pork-based insulin, this may not be accepted by some religions, right? Because of the pork, therefore compliance with the treatment may be reduced. So then we're going to find other ways or other treatments to help this child. Now, children with uh, diabetes mellitus, there are growing and additional dimensions of this disorder and its treatment will become evident. They will have, their growth is not steady. They may have, a, um, this may occur in spurts and they may have plateaus that affect the treatment. An infant and a toddler may have hydration problems and the preschool age children have irregular activity and eating patterns. And the school age children, they may grieve over the diagnoses because their, their friends aren't going through it so they don't understand why they have to. And this may uh, use illness to gain attention or to avoid responsibilities. That's a very big one that we see um, in some 
sometimes, you know, we use the wrong wording when we say that the parents have guilt or things like that, or they're just not making the child do X, Y, or Z. And sometimes it's because the, um, the child has seen, you know, where they can use their illness to get out of things and then, but this doesn't help them in the long run as adults. And the onset of puberty may require insulin adjustments. Um, and adolescents often resent this. This may lead to rebellion against their parents, rebellion from their care team, um, and any treatments. Now, there's a triad of management of DM, and that is that we need a well-balanced diet, precise insulin administration, and regular exercise. And we need to get them into a pattern of doing the triad of management so that they can take care of themselves uh, more readily as they grow. And we need to discuss with them the teaching plan for the child with diabetes. There are several things that we need to teach and, and have the parents to do. Like we, they need to understand the child and the parent and their care team. The foot care, you know, infections, how infections can make them get sicker, um, emotional upset. Uh, and like, let's go back to even like foot care. Like there's a young lady that I do know and she's a diabetic and she's 13 and her friends go to get pedicures done all the time. What do you guys know about that? You know, you guys know that as her being a diabetic, you know, child, she cannot just go to any place to get her toes done because then that can induce infection for her. Uh, we must teach them or deal with emotional upsets, urine checks, some um, psychology, psychology things that go on with them, a uh, physiology of the pancreas and its functions function of insulin. What is insulin? How does it work? Uh, how to check their blood glucose levels? When to check their blood glucose levels? What about their diet? Like diet therapy. They're going to need to understand the glycemic index of food and, and cholesterol intake. Now we all know that no child wants to learn that and have to do it. We don't want to and we're full adults, right? But this is something that we have to teach them to do and to take control of. A lot of time we've learned that if we give them more of a sense of controlling the situation, then they tend to do better because they feel like they are controlling the situation. But we have to sit, set it up where they can understand that. Now, we also want to teach them uh, care with traveling, you know, follow-up care, illnesses, how to keep themselves from getting ill, what to do if they have to go to the dentist, what to do if they have to have any surgeries, what about if they're in sports, um, who to let know what's going on, how to know what they're feeling, to know if they need to slow down or if they need to let the coach know that something's happening, uh, skin care, exercise, um, all of those things need to take effect, okay? Now, with nutritional management we know that we have to ensure the normal growth and development of the child and to distribute the food intake so that it aids uh, the metabolic controls correctly we need to individualize the diet in accordance with the child's ethnic background their age their sex their uh, weight activity family economics okay and their food preferences or it just ain't gonna happen all right the total um Estimated caloric intake is based on food, um, body size, and surface area. Now, most carbohydrate intake should consist of complex carbohydrates that will absorb slowly and do not cause sudden and widened elevation of the blood glucose level. Also, dietary fiber for diabetics, uh, they should have a soluble fiber that has... Um, been shown to reduce the blood glucose levels, to lower the serum cholesterol values, and sometimes reduce insulin requirements. Fiber also slows the rate of absorption. Now, when it comes to insulin administration, like I stated a little while ago, we have to be very careful in teaching them about administering their insulin. Yes, we need the parents over it while they're children, but we need to teach them so that they all know what's going on and how to do it. It gives them autonomy and it helps them to take care of themselves. But while we're teaching the parent, we're also teaching the child. And insulin cannot be taken orally because it is a protein and it will be broken 
weighted down by the gastric juices. So insulin is given by injection form, okay? Now, usual methods of administration is subcutaneous, okay? Also, there's these very, very good insulin pumps uh, that have a closed loop system. Now, I do teach the insulin pump when I go out uh, and do uh, primary care, uh, education for diabetics uh, and just especially gestational diabetic moms we put them on the insulin pump a lot of the time with all their controls in it so all they have to do is read their blood glucose and then the pump will administer what's needed because we have learned that that is safer uh, for this baby you know while the mother you know is still carrying the baby and then for children we have learned that it is safer because then the insulin is continuing to self uh, release as the body is uh, monitoring per this pump. Now, we need to understand that there are sites of injections. They need to be rotated to prevent poor absorption and injury to the tissue. Because if you're doing it in the same spot every time, as I'm pretty sure that you guys are aware, it's just a refresher, that a little bit of scar tissue will start to build up there. And then they have decreased absorption, okay? Now, lipotrophy can occur if the, if the sites are not rotated and this should not they should not inject into the areas that would have a temporary increase in circulation uh, for example if a child is pedaling a bike you would not inject it into the leg because that area has increased circulation hopefully that makes sense to you now with the insulin, the main difference is in the amount required for it to take effect and the length to protect and the timing. So the response to any given insulin dose is highly individualized and it depends on many factors such as the site of injection, local deconstruction, of the insulin by tissue and enzymes and the insulin antibodies. Insulin can also be given through a pump device like we just discussed a little while ago. Now let's talk about insulin shock. So insulin shock, also known as hypoglycemia, this is where the blood glucose level becomes abnormally low and it's caused by too much insulin. Now the factors are poorly planned exercise, reduced diet, and errors made because of improper knowledge of insulin and the insulin syringe. Okay, um, Children are more prone to insulin reactions than adults because the condition itself is more unstable in young people. They are growing and their activities are more irregular than an adult. The symptoms of an insulin reaction is normally things like irritability. They may have, um, they may behave poorly. They may become pale. Um, they may complain of feeling hungry or feeling weak or having sweats. The central nervous system, um, will have some um, arises because of the blood glucose and this vital proper action of the nerves will not be working as well because of the hypoglycemia. Now the immediate treatment for insulin shock is administering sugar in some form such as orange juice, hard candy, or a commercial product. And now we tend to give a lot of children those uh, sugar tabs that come with their insulin um, in case their insulin uh, falls too far, then they just pop up one of those uh, little medical sugar tabs. Now, they may begin to feel better within a few minutes, and then they may eat a small amount of protein or starch to prevent another reaction from happening. Glucagon is recommended in cases of severe hypoglycemia. Remember that. Now, we're going to move on to Samanji phenomenon, and this is the rebound of hyper. Glycemia. Now, this is when the blood glucose levels are lowered to a point at which the body counter regulatory the hormone of ephedrine, cortisol, and, glu and uh, glucagon uh, are released. Now, glucose is released from muscle and liver cells, which leads to a rapid rise in blood glucose levels in the system. 
So that's the rebound, okay? Now, generally, the result of chronic insulin use, especially in patients who require fairly large doses of insulin to regulate their blood glucose sugars, and they have hypoglycemia during the night and then high glucose levels in the morning, these are suggestive of the phenomenon. And now a child may need less insulin, not more, to rectify this problem. Now, this differs from the dawn phenomenon, okay, in which the early morning elevated blood glucose occur without preceding hypoglycemia. But this may be a response to a growth hormone secretion that occurs in early morning hours. Now, together, the Somanji and the dawn phenomenon are the most common causes of instability in children that have diabetes. Now, with type 2 diabetes, this is thought to be precipitated by things like obesity, low physical activity, lipid-rich diets that result in insulin resistance. The diet is, main, is the main emphasis of management along with exercise and other weight control measurements. Insulin and oral hypoglycemic medications contribute to stable control of blood glucose levels. Now, within the United States, we are noting a very large increase in children and adolescents being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And this used to never have been seen before uh, because normally children who had diabetes, we always would say that they were like juvenile diabetics or what now we call type 1 diabetes. Uh, and then there was a shift. And the shift also went along with the rising um, percentage of childhood obesity in the United States. There are some countries that the adult diabetes levels are super duper low and they have zero type 2 diabetes in children. Not heard of. They just don't have it. But unfortunately, in the United States, where when a child can hold a french fry, we give it to them, um, we have noted some type 2 diabetes in young children and we also have noted with these studies that they have a higher incidence of becoming more ill than their parents did and their life expectancy being you know shorter than their parents uh due to uh obesity uh and poor food control and um no exercise okay so unfortunately as nurses this is something that um as we grow in the age of this phenomenon um you guys are going to probably start seeing more and more and there's going to be more and more studies and hopefully we come up with an answer for it okay thank you